Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be jumping right into the disappearance of Kristen Mataferi, an 18 year old girl who disappeared while on summer vacation in San Francisco, California, and she is still missing 23 years later. Researching this case has taken me down quite a rabbit hole and there are many possible theories that we're going to be discussing. So grab a snack and settle in because we're going to take a deep dive into Kristen's life and disappearance. Kristen Deborah Montefiore was born to her parents Deborah and Robert on June 1, 1979. They lived in Danbury, Connecticut at the time Kristen was born, but eventually decided to relocate to Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's where they raised their four daughters, Allison, Kristen, Lauren, and Megan. They were a middle to upper class family. Debbie was an elementary school teacher and Bob was an engineer. They lived in a nice five bedroom home in a quiet upscale neighborhood in South Charlotte. Kristen can be described as a good kid who excelled academically. She was very creative and often spent her free time with her sisters, listening to music, creating art, or practicing her photography. She attended Providence High School where she did exceptionally well and won a full scholarship to the University of North Carolina, which was a huge achievement because it was a four year scholarship and highly competitive. She did so well in high school that she actually graduated a year early in 1996 and headed off for her first year at UNC, pursuing a degree in industrial design. And she did all of this when she was only 17 years old. In addition to her academic career, she was also very responsible and a hard worker. She worked at a pizza joint in Charlotte called Wolfman's all throughout high school and her freshman year. UNC was the perfect school for Kristen from her parents' perspective. Because she was still so young, they were more comfortable with having her close by and she would come home regularly. They were still heavily involved in her life and all of the decisions that she made. She completed her freshman year about a month before her 18th birthday and decided that she really wanted to travel throughout the summer. Kristen took school very seriously and at the time UNC was encouraging their students to travel and basically gain some life experiences over the summer if they were able to. I mean what 18 year old doesn't want to break away from their parents and get to experience something new and exciting. She did her research before she brought it to her parents and decided that San Francisco, California would be the perfect place to spend her summer. A friend from UNC was also going to be spending the summer there, and Kristen was really excited when she discovered that the University of California was offering a summer photography class at their Berkeley campus. After she had researched it thoroughly, she finally brought it up to Debbie and Bob, and they shut it down very quickly. They weren't open to the idea and told her that they weren't comfortable with it because it was too far away and Kristen had never really been on her own. She didn't let that be the last of the conversation though. The more her parents told her that they weren't comfortable with it, the more she pleaded with them about going on the trip. She promised them that she would still be working hard throughout the summer and that she wouldn't be partying or anything like that. They had always known Kristen to be responsible and they really took that into consideration. She had always maintained excellent grades, maintained a part-time job, and had never really done anything to betray their trust. Though they were still hesitant and worried, they felt that their daughter deserved to be able to spend her summer the way that she wanted to. They didn't want to hold her back from any opportunity, so they ultimately agreed to let her go. Kristen, being the type of person that researched everything and made sure that she was always well prepared, immediately started searching for a place to live. Once she began researching, she figured out that rent in San Francisco, even back in the 90s, was incredibly expensive and that she wouldn't be able to afford it. She took to Craigslist, which was brand new at the time, and found an affordable room to rent across the bay. She immediately called about the room and spoke with a man named Griffin Cherry, who lived in the house and had posted the room for rent. The situation was pretty ideal. Because she would be living with four other roommates, it was affordable, had no lease, and she'd have the freedom to pay month to month while she was there. Kristen and Griffin spoke about the neighborhood and he reassured her and her parents that it was a very safe neighborhood. 274 Jane Avenue is located in the Adams Point District in Oakland. It's a beautiful 2,500 square foot home with five bedrooms and three bathrooms, and it's only a short walk away from the Bay Area transit system, known as the BART. This would be ideal because Kristen planned to fly out to California and would not have her own transportation. During the phone call, she agreed to pay Griffin $500 a month for the duration of her stay, and that would cover rent as well as her share of the utilities. Apparently, there was some trouble with the owner of the home, 
The house was in foreclosure due to the owner no longer paying the mortgage, despite receiving rent for the property. However, due to California eviction laws, the roommates had five more months to move out of the home, which would be after Kristen had returned to North Carolina, so she didn't really mind. She'd be sharing the house with four other roommates, all of them being young men, who were somewhat close in age to Kristen. She didn't seem to mind this though, and felt that this was the perfect opportunity. She was close enough to everything, but was still able to afford the room. Alright, let's talk about the four roommates and the dynamic of the house for just a minute. The ringleader of the house was the man that Kristen spoke to, Griffin Cherry. At the time, his girlfriend was living there as well, but she decided that she was going to go travel for the summer and the two agreed to break up, which freed up Kristen's room. In addition to Griffin, two brothers were living in the home as well named Hans and Kurt Opsahl, who I believe were friends with Griffin. I believe they possibly even worked together as website designers based out of the home. The fourth roommate, a man named Justin Neisler, was kind of the odd man out. Like Kristen, he rented a room for the summer and didn't have any connection to the other roommates. I get the feeling that he kind of stuck to himself and would just kind of like come and go but I just wanted to give a little more context to the situation that Kristen was flying out to. So things started falling together and she prepared to fly out to California on June 1st, 1997, which was actually her 18th birthday. She packed up her camera gear and she was on her way. Once she arrived, her roommates were waiting to pick her up and she immediately called her parents to let them know that she had arrived safely and all was well. Kristen wasted virtually no time once she arrived in Oakland. The photography class that she was going to be attending started in about three weeks, and she knew she was going to be busy with school and work after June 24th, so she wanted to squeeze as much sightseeing as she could in the next couple of weeks. The morning after her flight, she woke up bright and early to get ready for the day. She had brought resumes with her from North Carolina and set out to find herself a job. She took the BART into San Francisco, which took approximately 20 minutes. Kristen headed downtown and found her way into the Crocker Galleria, which is located in the financial district of San Francisco. She went to various businesses in the mall, handing out her resume, and it didn't take long before she walked into a coffee shop called Spinelli's and was hired on the spot. They actually weren't hiring at the time, but Bernadette, the manager, was so impressed with what Kristen had to say and her enthusiasm that she hired her right on the spot. She was very clearly a go-getter and managed to not only get hired at Spinelli's, but also at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. From that day forward, she would work from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. almost daily and then she had her evenings to go and explore the city and this became her routine every single day because she knew she had limited time to enjoy herself she acted as a tourist every day hitting up every single site that she could often staying out from 3 p.m. to about midnight on her excursions Jumping forward a bit to June 23rd, 1997, like any other day, Kristen woke up early and headed to Spinelli's for her shift. While there, she spoke with three different co-workers, John, Kelly, and Alan, about what she should do that evening once her shift ended. It was the last day before her photography class was supposed to begin, and she wanted to have one last hurrah before it was time to get back to her responsibilities. The only problem was that she had already been to see everything, and there wasn't a lot left to do. Because she was new in town, she didn't really have many friends to spend time with and was kind of lost about where to go next. Kristen told one of her co-workers that she was considering going down to Baker Beach that afternoon because there was a pool party going on. By the time her shift ended, she still hadn't made up her mind about what she wanted to do, but left anyway. Interestingly, she forgot to clock out from Spinelli's that day, but her co-workers claimed that she left at 3 p.m. on the dock. However, her co-workers told investigators that they saw her still in the mall about 45 minutes later, walking side by side on the second floor with a blonde woman. They assumed that this was someone that Kristen knew because even though they weren't speaking, their body language and the fact that they were walking shoulder to shoulder seemed to suggest that. She was also spotted on surveillance footage at the Wells Fargo Bank that was located inside the Crocker Galleria, and from what I know, she was alone at that time. It's unclear how much money she withdrew, and that was the last time that anyone ever saw or spoke with Kristen Mataferi. But I want you guys to remember this later in the video. Kristen never came home that evening, but her roommates claimed that they either didn't notice or didn't find it unusual at the time. They initially thought that maybe she had started seeing someone and she just stayed over there. No big deal. There were no red flags or reasons for them to believe that their roommate was in trouble at that time. 
So as I said earlier, the photography class began the following day, but Kristen never showed. Remember the friend I mentioned earlier that attended UNC with Kristen and was also spending the summer in San Francisco? Well, she happened to be taking the photography class at Berkeley as well, and thought that it was weird that Kristen didn't show. She tried to call her a few times and left messages on the answering machine, however, she never received a call back. The next day, when Kristen still didn't show and still wasn't answering her calls, the friend decided to call Kristen's parents and see if they knew why she wasn't answering. At first, the girl was kind of annoyed and worried that she did something to offend Kristen, but the Montefiores instantly knew that something was wrong. It wasn't like their daughter to not show up for class and not return phone calls, so they were instantly suspicious. Kristen had called them the Sunday prior, which was Father's Day, and left a message for her dad, but after that, she was silent. They called the house a few times, finally leaving a message for Kristen to call them back. Back then, it was more common for people to have a landline rather than a cell phone with an answering machine for anyone who lived there. When Griffin heard the message from the Montefiores, he called them back and spoke with them, informing them that he hadn't seen their daughter in approximately three days. Once again, they knew that wasn't like Kristen, but still believed that it was just a misunderstanding at that point. They booked the next flight out there anyway and arrived in San Francisco on June 27th. Immediately after landing, they headed to the Oakland Police Department to report Kristen missing, and as always, they didn't start investigating right away because the investigating officer had gone home for the weekend and told them to come back on Monday. The Montefiores knew in their hearts that the Oakland PD were wrong. They knew that Kristen wouldn't disappear or fall off the map without saying anything to anyone. She had always been responsible and always showed up for her obligations. Not only that, she was incredibly excited to attend a photography class at Berkeley and had actually paid $925 out of her own pocket to attend the class. When they didn't receive the response that they were hoping for from the police department, the Montefiores took control of the situation themselves. They immediately printed up flyers and their entire family, including Kristen's seven-year-old little sister, passed them out all throughout San Francisco. They also hired a private investigator who spoke with multiple coworkers at Spinelli's, as well as Kristen's roommates. When they searched her room, they were actually surprised to find a local newspaper called the Bay Times. When they opened it up, they realized that Kristen had actually circled a personal ad that read, friends, female seeking friends to share activities who enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee, or simply the beach, and exploring the Bay Area. Interested? Call me. The Oakland PD finally started to take Kristen's disappearance more seriously on Monday, June 30th. By this point, she had already been missing for seven days and had failed to pick up her $400 paycheck from Spinelli's and still no one had heard from her. Detectives looked into the ad that was circled, but unfortunately, it led them nowhere. Because a week had passed already, the newspaper had already purged their backlog. They didn't find any evidence that Kristen had responded to the ad, but there isn't any evidence that she didn't either. I want to talk about a few strange things regarding Kristen's roommates. They noticed that she hadn't come home on Monday and Tuesday night. However, they hesitated to call the Montefiores, despite the fact that they had spoken with them numerous times when Kristen first moved in. They claimed that they had spoken with Kristen's friend that was in San Francisco as well, and were waiting to see if she showed up for the class on Wednesday, two days after she disappeared. However, Bob called the house first, and that's why her parents were made aware that their daughter was missing. That's not that weird, I guess. It's a decent explanation, but there are some weird things that go along with it that I want to talk about. Prior to her disappearance, Kristen signed up for a library card in San Francisco. She had been waiting on her card to be mailed to her, and it finally came after she went missing, though she was still unofficially missing at that time. When it arrived, prior to speaking with the Montefiores, one of the roommates actually opened her mail to see what was inside. Apparently, they wanted to see if it gave them any clues as to where she was, but then placed it back in the mailbox once they saw what it was. It is bizarre to me that they were concerned enough that they needed to open her mail and be nosy, but not concerned enough to call her parents and let them know that Kristen hadn't come home. Another red flag is that Kristen had withdrawn $500 from her Wells Fargo account on June 20th to give to Griffin for July's rent. When she tried to give him the money, he refused to take the cash, even though that's how she paid him prior. But now, he suddenly wanted a money order? 
Griffin later told the Mata Fairies that the rent she was paying wasn't ever going to the actual landlord due to the house being in foreclosure, and that he asked her to deposit the money back into her account and get a money order. Kristen agreed, but she never deposited the money back into her account. In fact, if you remember correctly, she went and withdrew money from her account on the day that she went missing. Why would she withdraw more money when she already had the $500 on her? And why would Griffin insist that Kristen bring him a money order when the money wasn't even going to the landlord anyway? And if they weren't paying rent, where was Kristen's money actually going? I understand general expenses and utilities, but if each roommate was paying $500 a month, that's $2,500 that they were allegedly spending on utilities and expenses like toilet paper. That seems unnecessarily high to me, but maybe that's just me. I don't buy it. Anyway, as investigators tried to track Kristen down, word spread around the Bay Area about her disappearance. The media started to pick up on her story, and by that Wednesday, so on July 3rd, something really strange happened. The local news station received an anonymous call from a man claiming that he knew what happened to Kristen. He provided them with some very specific and even graphic details. He claimed that both women were lesbians who worked at the YMCA and they were interested in Kristen. But when she didn't reciprocate their advances, they became angry and killed her in the backseat of a car. They then allegedly took her to a forest area past the Golden Gate Bridge before being put under a wooden bridge. Obviously, the news station was shocked and immediately phoned the Oakland Police Department with the information. It didn't take investigators long before they tracked down the two women that the caller was talking about. They looked into it further and determined that it was a false report. And when they questioned them about who would make a false claim against them, they both gave the same name, John Anuma. Apparently, John Anuma was furious with the two women because they had gotten his girlfriend fired from the YMCA. He was so upset over the situation that he actually came to the YMCA and physically threatened both of them. When investigators showed up at John's front door, he denied making the call at first before eventually coming clean. He said he falsely implemented the women to get revenge and that it was just a bad joke. So yeah, he seems like he was definitely sane and a completely normal person. By this point, investigators were taking Kristen's disappearance very seriously, and John Onuma's name has always remained at the top of their list. Investigators used bloodhounds to track Kristen's scent, which led them from the bus stop outside of Crocker Galleria to the Muni 38 Geary bus. They traced her all the way to the end of the bus route near Sutro Heights Park, near the Land's End Beach, and that's where it stopped. Sutro Heights Park is only about a 10 minute drive away from the Baker Beach, which is where Kristen told her co-workers that she may go. However, they found no evidence that connected back to Kristen. That's pretty much where the official leads went cold for many, many years. There are more recent developments that happened in 2015 and 2017, which I'll get into shortly, but I want to talk about some of the other things that transpired and some theories before we get to that. Not long after Kristen's disappearance, a man living in Charlotte heard about what was going on and decided that he wanted to do what he could to help the Mata Fairies. That man's name is Dennis Mahone, and he's helped uncover a lot of things about Kristen's case with permission from her family. Once they agreed to let him help, he actually took vacation time from work for an extended period of time and headed across the country to California so that he could investigate. He, along with the private investigator that the Mata Fairies hired, got right to work. Dennis spoke with Kristen's family, roommates, and co-workers on multiple occasions, as well as John Anuma and people directly involved with him, and he's still involved with the case today. In fact, I owe him a lot of credit for some of the information that I'm outlining in this video. He has a website that's dedicated to Kristen's disappearance, which I'll have linked below, that has a lengthy summary about his findings throughout the time he was investigating this, and it's been a great resource because he is very thorough. He's also appeared on numerous podcasts and such. One of the things that Dennis discusses on the site is a sketchy thing about the house next door from Kristen's house in Oakland. Dennis discovered after talking to another neighbor that the house was actually being used as a halfway house which both the Monteferi family and the Oakland Police Department were unaware of. Which I find kind of insane because I don't understand how they'd miss something like that if and when they canvassed the neighborhood after Kristen disappeared. But somehow it was overlooked. 
Once he looked into the history of 278 Jane Avenue, he discovered that the house had far more history than anyone could have expected. Apparently in the 1960s, the house was used as a convalescent hospital and was closed down due to licensing issues in 1985. It's been a breeding ground for a lot of disturbing things, such as a pit bull breeding site, a rabbit slaughtering farm, a meth lab, an illegitimate restaurant, which was shut down by the health department after they poisoned a couple of people, and were selling drugs on the side. It's also been a quote, a rooming house for mentally ill indigents, as well as a program for youth with gender issues. Shortly after Dennis reported that information, investigators obtained a search warrant for John's apartment after four women came forward claiming that Jill, John's girlfriend, had used newspaper ads to lure them in. Once they met up with her, she would lead them back to her boyfriend John, who would then do what you can imagine he'd be doing in a scenario like that. One woman reported that after he was done doing what he did, that he said, quote, the same thing that happened to Kristen Montefiore could happen to you and you will meet the same fate as Kristen Montefiore at another. Inside his apartment, they found what can be described as a sizable and suspicious amount of cat blood, as well as Jill's diary and daily planner. When they opened up the planner to see if there was any clues or evidence, they realized that the two days that lined up with Kristen's disappearance had been ripped out of the book. In addition to the missing pages, they also coincidentally found Matthew Luque's name and information written inside. By that point, he had started working at Spinelli's, the same coffee shop that Kristen was working at, alongside Kelly Strathman, a co-worker that was working on the day of her disappearance. In addition to that coincidence, it also came out that Jill had broken up with Matthew Luque to start dating John and Numa prior to Kristen's disappearance. We all know what I say about coincidences. So all of these people are connected in one way or another. Kristen worked alongside Kelly Strathman, Kelly Strathman was very good friends with Matthew Luque. Matthew Luque dated Jill Lampo, and Jill Lampo broke up with Matthew Luque to date John Anuma, who later inserted himself into Kristen's investigation by making a false report claiming that he knew what happened to Kristen. Not long after Kristen's disappearance, John and Jill split up, and she actually told people that she broke up with him because she was afraid for her life after he tried to kill her to death. When she moved out of his apartment, she left behind very valuable belongings, including her most important and most expensive music equipment, simply because she was scared to ever go back there. John Anuma continues to act suspicious and claims that he took a polygraph test and passed. However, that's never been confirmed by investigators. He also relocated to Hawaii about a year after Kristen disappeared. I want to jump forward a little bit to June of 2012. Almost 15 years after Kristen went missing, Jill Lampo called her uncle and began confessing all of the things she's ever done wrong in her life. She was basically having a nervous breakdown and spoke about everything that was wrong for about four hours. At some point, her uncle began taking notes about the things that she was saying, and it's lucky that he did because she started confessing to participating in a quote, unspeakable kidnap and murder after she got involved with a controlling man who convinced her to help, and she said the guilt was tearing her apart. This information is all on Dennis Mahone's website, findkristen.com. And given that he is so close with the family, I don't think he would have put this up had the information not been verified. Anyway, the uncle didn't really know what to do with the information and didn't want to get involved, but his wife felt that they should do something. She actually Googled Jill Lampo's name and came across the findkristen.com website. At that point, she was shocked that Jill could have been involved in something like that and made the decision to contact Dennis to report what Jill had said. I'm sure that it was also reported to the police, who have questioned Jill many times, but still no charges have been filed because they really don't have any evidence other than hearsay. In 2015, an independent search was conducted at 274 Jane Avenue by a former police sergeant named Paul Dosti. They actually brought in a very experienced cadaver dog that ended up alerting to the presence of human in the basement of the home. He, of course, reported the results of a search to the Oakland Police Department, but they had no response. Paul Dosti was also working with a forensic anthropologist from the University of Tennessee named Dr. Arpad Vass, who developed a device that detects human decomposition chemicals. They decided to visit the Jane Avenue house in 2017 and scan the entire property with this device. It indicated that there were decomposition 
acquisition materials located somewhere between 274 Jane Avenue, where Kristen lived, and 278 Jane Avenue, the house that was used as a halfway house at the time. In addition, the device also alerted to blood near a concrete slab that was at the bottom of the front steps of the halfway house. Upon this discovery, they contacted Bob and Debbie Mataferi and asked them for a DNA sample, which they provided, and determined that the decomposition material was a match. They determined that it's likely that it was at a crime scene rather than a burial site, considering that it was a concrete slab and the basement floor was clay, which would be very hard to dig with a shovel. All of which was reported to the Oakland Police Department, who didn't act on any of this information and basically didn't give a shit that there were people out there trying to basically do their job for them. They later released a statement and said that the information had not been confirmed by them and that the information had never been delivered to the department. They also claimed that Dr. Voss had never sent samples of the human decomposition testing. Both Paul Dosti and Dr. Voss adamantly denied that this is the case, and pointed out that the OPD should have enough resources to do their own testing because all they need to do is test the soil with something called GCMS, which every crime lab has access to. And that's basically the last update that we have into the disappearance of Kristen. Before we end this video, I do want to talk about a couple of other theories that are floating around so that you guys can decide what you believe happened to Kristen for yourselves. One theory is that Kristen came into contact with Robert Durst, who needs a whole video of himself for the things he's done. Some of you may have heard his story from the movie All Good Things with Kirsten Dunst and Ryan Gosling, but to sum it up, his wife mysteriously vanished, he murdered his friend, his neighbor, Anne is suspected in the disappearance of Karen Marie Mitchell, who went missing from Eureka, California when she was only 16 years old. He hasn't been charged with anything in relation to Karen Mitchell's disappearance, but there are some very interesting facts in that case that points to Durst. He visited the store that she was working at several times leading up to her disappearance, some of the time dressed as a woman. I'm not going to get into everything here in Kristen's video, but let me know if you guys want me to do a video on Robert Durst and his victims. Anyway, their disappearances are very similar. They disappeared almost five months apart exactly, and they only lived a few hours away from each other. In addition, Robert Durst was living in the area at the time of both of their disappearances, and his description matches the description that a witness gave in Karen's case. Some people speculate that Robert Durst could have been in San Francisco and run into Kirsten. As I stated earlier, Kirsten was seen 45 minutes after her shift ended, walking shoulder to shoulder with a blonde woman. Durst often dressed up up as a woman, so some people believe that he and Kristen could have run into each other in the Galleria, and he was the person walking with her, possibly with a blonde wig on. However, both the Oakland Police Department as well as the FBI have discounted this, stating that they have no evidence that would link Robert Durst to Kristen Mataferi. So it's just basically hypothetical at this point. While I won't rule it out because it's very similar, I find this to be the least likely theory in my opinion, based on all the evidence and all the other theories. Another theory that I don't find to be quite as likely is the thought that Kristen possibly drowned and that's why she just disappeared without a trace. If you remember, she told co-workers that she was intending to go to Baker Beach. Dogs traced her scent all the way to the Land's End Beach from the Galleria, which is where it stopped. According to locals, the Land's End Beach is a popular tourist area and is often crowded but is often cloudy and somewhat cold until about August. It was also a random Monday, so it's possible that there weren't a lot of people on the beach at that time. If she somehow fell into the water and drowned, it could have gone undetected given all of the fog and the day that she chose to visit. It is possible, I guess, given that her scent stopped at the beach, but I personally find it suspicious that no one would have seen anything or heard Kristen screaming, as one likely would at least attempt to do if they're swept underwater. The other theory is the one that I already discussed previously in this video. Is it possible that John Anuma, Jill Lampo, and Matthew Luque had something to do with Kristen's disappearance? It seems that investigators seem to think so, given that they have remained people of interest all of these years. Again, it's definitely possible, but there isn't much evidence that strongly suggests that they even knew Kristen. I'm kind of split between believing this theory and the last one that's on my list. The last is centered around the house on Jane Avenue. I find the way Kristen Kristen's roommates acted to be highly suspicious, but also, you never know how you're going to react in a situation like this. It would be incredibly bizarre to have your roommate go missing
anything and be thrown in the middle of a police investigation over someone that you barely know. There isn't really any evidence that suggests that they had something to do with it. However, I do find it suspicious that there are possible traces of human remains in their basement. If you discount the roommate theory, is it possible that someone from the juvenile halfway house had something to do with it? I mean, there were literal criminals living right next door who would be similar in age to Kristen. Is it possible that Kristen did go to Land's End Beach and spent the evening out there, but the dogs didn't pick up on her traveling back? Then when she was on her way home, one of the juvenile delinquents could have crawled out of the window, tried to make a pass at her, or even just waited to attack? That would explain the traces of her blood near the front steps, as well as traces of human decomposition between the two houses, which were incredibly close to each other. To me, this just seems like the most likely scenario. She had been there for a few weeks and had almost the same routine. She woke up and left for work around 6 to 6.30 a.m. and returned around 11 p.m. or midnight. That would have made it very easy for one of them to pick up on that routine and allow them to be waiting for her outside. Of course, I do think the John Anuva situation is incredibly bizarre. There is no solid evidence in the case, which is why none of them have ever been charged with anything in relation to Kristen's disappearance. Though the Oakland Police Department hasn't confirmed the findings from the searches in 2015 and 2017, that kind of makes it seem very obvious if you take their searches seriously. I think it's likely that OPD doesn't want to acknowledge their findings because that kind of points to the fact that they really dropped the ball on this case. They didn't investigate until three days after she was reported missing because everyone had gone home for the weekend and they failed to even discover that right next door, 278 Jane Avenue was being used as a halfway house for juvenile delinquents, aka literal criminals. The more I'm saying it out loud, it just seems more obvious to me. But I want to hear what you guys think about this case. Do you think John Anuma really was involved? Or do you think that something happened to Kristen a little closer to home? Let me know what you guys think in the comments. But that's all I got for you today, guys. Thank you for watching. And as always, remember the name, Casey Shane. I'm out.